Please put your hands together for Steve Hark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next year, there's an Olympic Games. There's an Olympic Games every four years. I want to explain to you why I think how the Olympic Games could just save your life. But I'm a sports engineer, started out in physics uh, about 30 years ago, and this is the kind of thing I've been doing for the last 30 years. So I went into sports engineering. I thought it was really, really exciting. There was a revolution going on when I entered it, and it was a materials revolution. It was about carbon fibers. It was about how you can use those carbon fibers to change design of sports equipment. Now here you've got a bike, uh, you've got someone sitting on it, he's got a, a, a modern helmet, he's got some clothing, and the bike we've optimized for performance using the aerodynamic study that you can see going on there uh, in the, on the screen. And the carbon fibers allowed us to change the design to improve that performance. Now that bike, you can actually buy that bike just down the road, and it's made not far from here. So we've got this knowledge, knowledge transfer from the Olympic Games all the way through to, to us, the general public, and we can buy that. Now another revolution happened not long after that, about 10, 15 years ago, when these devices start to come out, the iPod and the iPhone. And the iPhone, again, revolutionized what we did. We didn't know it at the time that it was going to be a revolution. And what happened was we had Olympic teams coming to us saying, hey, yeah, we know you can make bikes better. We know you can make helmets better. We know you can change boots, blades, and so on. But how do we know when we use them in practice that they actually work? Can you develop us some systems where we can actually measure what happens in the field when we're actually using them on the track, um, on the bobsled track, and so on? So before long, we had numerous systems out there that we developed for Team GB before uh, London 2012. We developed about 30 systems, and here's an example of one of them. So you've got a 400 meter runner uh, running past on a track, again, not, not far from here. And this system is very, very simple. It uses simple technology, it uses a camera system. And actually, it's a, it's a fixed camera system. It's pan, tilt, zoom, so we can use this tablet here to manipulate that camera and shine it in the place we want it to. Now all the intelligence is in the algorithm that's doing the image processing on there. And you can probably just see there are some dots on that screen where the athlete's feet touch the ground. Now, that tells us about the athlete's uh, stride length, stride frequency. Oh, can we now look at interventions? We can look at different shoes, we can look at the effect of different surfaces. And we can improve the performance of that athlete using that very simple technology. And what happened with this revolution was, Prior to that, we'd have to have cameras and cables and all sorts if we wanted to go and prove that something actually happened out there in situ in the big wide world. But here, we were suddenly allowed out there. We could take that data and we could prove things. It was very simple, very quick, and most importantly, immediate feedback. That was really, really important. So here's another version uh, of that software. So here we've got an old croc. Looks like he's looking for his car keys. Uh, shuffling across that, that laboratory. And actually, this is a, a health version of that elite athlete version. And what we've got there, you can see the footprints. You can see there's a slightly asymmetrical gait uh, of, that, of that bloke. And if you've got a balance issue, if you've got a problem with your inner ear, then it comes out in your gait. If you want to treat that balance issue, then you can see in the gait whether you've improved uh, the person's performance, whether you can improve um, the, the gait of that person. Equally, if you measure the gait, you can deduce if the person's got a balance issue. So this is what we're developing uh, for the local hospital. So we've taken that elite performance into a healthcare setting, again, for the wider use. And this is what I believe is the new revolution that's going on. We're going from this elite sport end into public health. And here we've got another thing that's been developed here in Sheffield. It's an app. It's on a phone. Now, phones nowadays, God, they're amazing. There's more power in that phone than the computer I started out with 30 years ago. There's an accelerometer in there that can measure your footsteps. We tried to buy an accelerometer like that probably only about 10, 15 years ago, and it was going to cost 1,000 pounds, and we couldn't afford to buy it. And it just wasn't going to do what we wanted to do. 
There's accelerometers on this, in this phone, but there's also GPS, rate gyroscopes, barometers that can tell you about altitude. They're amazing, amazing devices, and they cost far less than that single accelerometer that we wanted to buy. Now, we can start to use it to measure some things on there. How many steps you've done, how far you've walked, how high you've walked up some, uh, some stairs, because we can measure the change in pressure as you go up those stairs. So we have this ability to start measuring things in situ. Okay, so what? What's that got to do with you guys? I never really thought when I set out 30 years ago that I'd actually start quoting public health statistics in a talk like this. Uh, but I'm going to do that now. There's a website, a UK website, called the Public Health Outcomes Framework. As dry a title as you can ever find and guaranteed to put off the casual browser. But if you look in there, there's some amazing statistics. Amazing statistics about all the cities and towns across England. Statistics about life, death, birth, disease, how many fruit and veg we eat a day. Let's take one particular statistic. Let's think about Sheffield. Let's think about a baby girl being born today. So a baby girl being born today, you'd expect that girl to live to about 82 years. That's what the statistics tell us, about 82 years. That's pretty good. That's a lot more than it was 100 years ago. There's another statistic in there, which I was surprised to find. It was the healthy life expectancy. That healthy life expectancy for, for that baby girl today is only 59 years. So, so what are we saying there? Okay, this baby girl is born. We're expecting her to be healthy to the age of 59, and from 59 to 82 to be unhealthy. That's 23 years. I was astonished when I saw that. I thought, that can't be right. So I looked at all these other cities across the UK. Yeah, it's absolutely right. There's differences, obviously, but we have that a quarter of our lives are relatively unhealthy. So what's the cause of that unhealth? It's these modern diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, dementia, and cancers. So these are the modern diseases that people are developing. But, okay, this is a bit depressing. Do not despair. It does not have to be this way. We can change that. So there is a treatment that we can give you to stop you developing those diseases. And it'll reduce the risk of those diseases by between 20 and 40%. Not only that, but it's also free, it's available to everybody, and there are no side effects. Of course, that's physical activity. If this was a pill, people would say that it was a miracle cure. The pharmaceutical companies would be selling it. They would be making billions because of those reduced risk, of fa risk factors. That's better than most medicines. So, how much physical activity? What is the dose? Now we know what the treatment is, what is the dose? Well, that's the government guidelines. We all know about fruit and veg, five a day, five a day. So what about physical activity? It's that, 100, 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise. Put it into context, that's about the same length of time as the current James Bond movie takes. So that length of time, two and a half hours, that's what you need to do in the week, okay? And that is the dose that the government's saying you should do. So, okay, 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise, not particularly easy to, to, to remember. So let's turn it into day. It's about 20 minutes, it's a bit more, I've rounded it down, but 20 minutes per day of moderate exercise. Now the guidelines say it should be at least in 10 minutes bursts. So I'm gonna make it even easier for you to remember, it's two a day. Two a day of 10 minute bursts. That's all you need to do, and you can reduce your risk of catching all those diseases, and you can have a really nice, long, healthy life. So that's the dose, but the dose of what? Moderate exercise, what, what, what does that mean? Well, over in the States, some guys came up with a fantastically brilliant idea of how to quantify physical activity. And I wish I'd come up with this idea. They must have been in a bar, and I can imagine the conversation which was, hey, what can we use as a quantification of physical activity to everybody? What does everybody do that we can compare to? And they must have said, someone must have said, what about sitting on the sofa? Let's compare everything to sitting on the sofa. That will be our units. We'll make sitting on the sofa a unit of one. So the energy you expend in sitting quietly will be one. And that's one, it's called a MET, metabolic equivalent of task. 
So that is light exercise. So as you're sitting quietly here, that's your one met. So light exercise is between one and three. Moderate, which is where we're trying to get to, is between three and six. And vigorous, really going for it, is about six and above. Six times the energy of sitting on the sofa. So let's have a think of what kind of activities uh, we've got there. So watching TV is a little bit more than just sitting quietly, because hopefully you're engaged in that soap opera and you're spending a little bit more energy. OK, darts, actually, 2.5, still light activity, but a bit more than just sitting there, presumably because you're picking the darts up off the floor or taking them out the wall or whatever. Yes, sex is on there. On that, if you look on the compendium of physical activities, sex is in there. Uh, I'm sad to say that nothing goes more than light. Even the most vigorous sexual activity that somebody somewhere has quantified, what a great job that is, it's still light physical activity, so I'm sorry, it does not count as one of your two a day. So moderate physical exercise. Okay, these are the kind of things that become moderate, phys moderate physical exercise. These are what counts. Washing the car, three and a half. We're into that three zone. Now, this isn't the washing the car where you drive it to a car wash and put in your credit card <laughs> and watch the rollers go over. No, this is getting a bucket of sooty water, getting your hands in and getting some elbow grease on the top of that car. Working up a sweat, getting your heartbeat going a little bit. Vigorous housework. Okay, for those of you who do the housework in your house, I hope somebody does housework in your house. Okay, so the person that does it, you know that it's physically demanding. If you spend an hour doing that, you really have built up a sweat. If you don't like vigorous housework, get outside and play with the kids. Go and run around and play with the kids. That's getting to the top end of physical exercise. And actually, so what I'm saying here is it doesn't have to be sports. As long as it's physical activity, this is what is going to be good for you. That borderline between moderate and vigorous, that, that's what I like to call the, the, the dad run. This is the transition between walking and running. You know when you're kind of crossing the road and then you go, that car's getting a bit close and, and, and you just suddenly start running like this? <laughs> and you go, huh, I just meant to do that. So it's that, it's that transition. That's where that moderate to vigorous activity is. And so if you look at what is vigorous activity, you get things like running, uh, vigorous running, playing football, playing basketball, all those sporty activities. So there's 30% of people in this country and in Europe that do literally no physical activity. Well, okay, they do. They do sitting quietly on the sofa. They do number one. That's what they do. So there are people that are doing less than their two a day across the whole week. And that's what's causing our health services to implode because we just can't afford to do that. Now, why is that? The reason is because, you know what, we spent the last 200 years engineering physical activity out of our lives. And to be honest, I spent the last 30 years making sport easier. Because you make sport easier, you can improve performance. So I'm partly responsible to this. What we want to do is we want to reverse that process. So we've engineered physical activity out of your lives. That, that includes planes, trains, automobiles, elevators, lifts, remote controls. So we now have the technologies to measure how much phys physical activity um, you're undertaking during your daily activities. And we can tell you if you've done your 10 minutes or your two a day. So we are going to set up a, uh, an advanced wellbeing research center not far from here to do exactly that. We're going to take some of these technologies and I'm going to start putting these nudges back into your lives. How can we motivate you, you, and you, my wife, my grandma, my friends, to just do that little bit more that will improve their health? So the rub of it is this. Just before the last Olympic Games, there was a study in The Lancet that showed that if you do your 20 minutes of physical exercise in a day, you can re reduce the risk of early death by about 10%, a little bit more. If you do more physical exercise, you increase that reduced risk, or you make it better. If you do it more vigorously, you make it better. It didn't get worse, it only gets better. So if you do some physical exercise, you do it more vigorously, the benefits just increase. 
So next year, when you're watching the Olympic Games, think about the technologies that you've got that might measure, might help you, motivate you to do some more physical activity. It might just be a watch. It might just be a dog. Go and run outside with the dog. So when you watch the Olympic Games, and you watch Usain Bolt in the 100 meter sprint, Jess Ennis in the heptathlon, Mo Farah in the 5,000 meters, think, have I done my two a day? And if you haven't, go out and do it, because you never know, it might just save your life. Thank you.